Good evening, everybody. Welcome back to the Mythgard Academy. This is session number 25 of the Lamor Darthur class. Uh, and we are coming close to... So I don't think we have any realistic chance of getting through the final section tonight. The last section is not an enormous amount of reading, but... The Lancelot and Elaine section is kind of dense in a couple different ways, right? Uh, not only do we get a really important uh, plot movement there, of course, with uh, you know sort of the beginning of the crisis of the relationship of Lancelot and Guinevere, um, but also we get like a bunch of random appearances of the Holy Grail, right? So we should, um, uh, you know, we have to be a little bit. <laughs> prudent in how we uh in how we, we we go through this so i'm not i do not think we're going to get through the entire thing uh but we'll do uh we'll do as much as we can do here tonight um before i get started though i wanted to uh just make a couple quick announcements uh one is announcement it's been out there for a couple days but i wanted to make sure to emphasize it because it's super big news, and that is the registration for MythMoot is finally open. Uh, we had a bit of a delay this year uh, as we were working through some things. Uh, we love our new venue uh, that we were, we've been at for the last couple years. Um, uh, sometimes there are a couple challenges in trying to work things out with our back office, but nevertheless, we persevered and we got everything straightened out. Uh, so uh, we are finally ready officially to open registration, which we have done. Um, so if you just go to signumuniversity.org and scroll down a little bit, you will see it on the events page right there, uh, a, a link to the MythMoot page where you can register. There's also a link on that page. Uh, on the on the MythMoot page uh, to the call for papers as well, so you can see the you know proposals on lots of different kinds of proposals, not just reading papers, but doing other uh, proposals. I'm totally submitting one this year. I'm gonna uh, I'm planning to do a session. I uh, I teased it uh, at um, TextMoot because it was super relevant to the topic of, text, of text moot. Uh, but I, I, I'm not I wasn't fully prepared to give it yet. Uh, but I'm gonna be doing. Well, we'll see how much time they'll give me. I hope they'll give me at least an hour. I would love at least an hour uh, to do a close analysis of uh, of uh, uh, Eminem. I'm going to do it on an Eminem song. I am absolutely fascinated uh, by the usage of, uh, of 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 sound and and and, and verse techniques uh, in modern rap music, which is so brilliant. Um, uh, the uh, anyway. I thought I could talk about that a lot more later on, but I've been wanting to do this for a really long time, uh, and I'm finally going to get a chance uh, to sit down and do this. I think it is absolutely fantastic. So anyhow, uh, I'm excited about that. There are going to be lots of things going on. MythMoot, of course, is fantastic. A lot of you have been there before. If you haven't been, you totally owe it to yourself to come. Uh, you know, it's like... Um, uh, I don't even know what it's like. It's like myth mood. There's nothing else like it. Uh, being surrounded by wonderful people who all, you know, love the same things that you love and, uh, you know, getting to just be in sort of constant, uh, friendly geek out mode for days and days. It is pretty cool. So anyhow, um, that is, um, uh, uh, that is, uh, the, the, I say, the biggest announcement of the day is to emphasize, uh, go ahead and you can register for MythMoot. Uh, you can uh, start looking at the call for proposals, and we will be, we are moving forward with that. The dates, of course, I think I've mentioned the dates before, but it's just to confirm, the dates are June 27th through 30th, so the very end of June uh, is when we're going to be is when is when we're going to be there. And uh, Lynn, yes, great question. So we are. Doing a couple things uh, with the Morgan exhibit. For those of you who uh, have not heard, the big Tolkien exhibit uh, of Tolkien's visual art uh, that was over in the Bodleian uh, this past fall, the biggest uh, exhibit of Tolkien's stuff uh, uh, in a long, long time. Anyway, it has traveled, or most of it has traveled, not quite all of it, but the majority of it has traveled uh, over here to America, and it is at the Morgan Library in New York. And uh, that exhibit opens on the 25th of January and will go through, I think, sometime in May. 
um, we were looking to we, we were thinking about the possibility of running a, a regional moot there in New York during the uh, during this time to sort of coordinate with the exhibit. Um, I don't think a, 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 f a regular, a full regional moot is going to happen, but we are fortunate that there is already going to be a Tolkien conference. The New York City uh, Tolkien conference is going to be happening there in the middle of March. Uh, and so we're, what we're planning to do is just kind of coordinate on that weekend. We're going to have a, we're going to have a, uh, <laughs> somebody called it last night, a moot up. Uh, instead of having a, a full uh, conference, we're going to take advantage of the fact that they're already throwing a conference, uh, going to attend that conference, and then we're going to have uh, a, uh, a gathering afterwards uh, for all of our awesome Signum people to get a chance at least to connect and, and hang out for a while. So we'll go to the conference together during the day, uh, and then we can uh, go out for a pint afterwards. So uh, we're still organizing details of that, but we, you know, we'll sort of get back to you uh, uh, more as we move forward and kind of refine where we're going to be and, and then start coordinating that. But yep, that's definitely happening. Uh, another thing I would mention, I was actually invited to go down and speak on a panel. I'm actually moderating a panel um, uh, at the Sheen Center uh, in New York. The Sheen Center, it's S-H-E-E-N. You can, you can Google that and you find the website there. The, the Sheen Center is affiliated with the Catholic Archdiocese of New York. And uh, they're holding this, uh, uh, this, this really great um, evening where we're going to have a, a discussion. We're we'll looking at some of the images from the exhibit. Uh, and discussing that, it's going to be so. I'm going to be moderating the panel, and then we will also have two other people. One, uh, Holly Ordway, a wonderful Tolkien scholar, uh, who's going to be uh, who's going to be, of course, commenting a lot on that. And also uh, John McQuillan, who is the uh, the the curator of the exhibit. So he's going to come and he's going to be talking about the exhibit, and uh, Holly Ordway is going to be commenting on it, and I'm going to be commenting on it, and we're going to have a fun, really fun conversation. So that's going to be on February 12th. So that's near the very beginning uh, of the time. So would be a really cool way to kind of get a little sort of introduction to the exhibit, uh, sort of at the beginning of the exhibit season and a month uh, before our, uh, you know, the uh, New York Tolkien Conference get together down there. So um, if you wanted to look that up, that is a ticketed event, but there are still seats open, I believe. And as I say, that's uh, on uh, Tuesday, on Tuesday, February 12th at 7 p.m., uh, you can go to, as I said, to the Sheen Center website, and there's uh, links for tickets and stuff there. So I hope to hope to see some of you there at the uh, February event. Um, cool. All right. So those are the things that are coming up immediately. A bunch of people have been asking about, wanted to make sure to talk about those. I'll have more updates about other regional moots and things coming up very soon. So, uh, but for now, I just wanted to focus on those uh, things and let you know that they are available. All right. Um, so, tonight we're going to get back to Sir Palamides and Sir Tristram. You may remember, uh, and by the way, I, 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 was, I was really moved by last week's class. Last week's class was so much fun. I, I haven't lost, tra lost track of time that completely during a class uh, in a long time. Um, Really, I, I, I've just been, I've always, as I've said many times, really liked the story of Sir Palamides, and I'm finding it even more riveting this time through uh, than I ever have before. And we sort of left Sir Palamides at a really terrible moment that is at the very end of day three of the tournament at Lana Zepp. Uh, and that's the one where uh, Gareth and Dinadin and Tristram change sides, right? Because now Sir Lancelot and his kin and, uh, you know, King Arthur's side, are they're now the underdogs, right? They're now vastly outnumbered. And there's Sir Lancelot and his kin doing marvelous deeds of arms. And so Tristram and Dinadin uh, and uh, Sir Gareth applying the very knightly uh, rationale that Palamides himself uh, you know, it, it described at the very beginning of day one, right, about which side they should be on. They should be on the side that's the underdog, right, because um, uh, that's the most knightly thing to do. So applying that logic, they decide to switch sides, and Palamides does not go with them uh, on the for the specious reason, right, that uh, he wants to stay with the side that he came in on. But of course, really, we know it's because he wants to be against Sir Tristram. He wants the excuse to be able to fight against Sir Tristram and to prove himself against Sir Tristram uh, and to indulge, you know, his envy and try to take down Sir Tristram. We've seen him uh, giving in to this kind of, um, uh, to this kind of temptation, right? And, uh, 
uh, and here and, and you know, on this day, it's interesting because in, in one sense, what he does, it's not exactly dishonorable. Right. Um, that is to say, it's not like he's cheating. It's not like he's stabbing somebody in the back. It's not even like, I mean, in a sense, the decapitation of Lancelot's horse was worse. Right. It was a more unknightly act. Uh, Lancelot was ticked about that, like personally offended. Nobody is personally offended by what Sir Palamides does, but everybody agrees he's lost all the worship that he gained. Right. This was an unworshipful thing for him to have done. Partly because, you know, he uh, he just partly because he does the wrong thing. And he, so it's like on the one sense, it's a it is negatively disworshipful, right? In the sense that by not switching over with the others, he fails to gain the worship that they do gain, right? So they, you know, then you know, they are praised for what they do and everyone is is left um, uh, is left, um, you know, uh, not talking about Sir Palamides, but of course, it's also positively disworshipful uh, in that he abandoned, you know, it's again, it's not exactly stabbing somebody in the back, but he didn't change. Not only did he not stay with the, you know, his group, right, that he came in with, that they all swore they'd stay together. Um, not only did he not do that, but, you know, he separated them f from them for the sake of being able to fight Sir Tristram, right? So again, it's not exactly backstabbing. Um, he's not trying to take Tristram at a disadvantage or anything like that. Um, and yet it's, it's, that it's clear to everyone, right? His desire to fight Sir Tristram is overcoming all of his good impulses, all of his positive, his impulses to do the right thing, which we see that he has, right? We saw that in, uh, we saw that in day one, right? Um, yeah, and, and Karita, that's exactly it. We see uh, Palamides at several points during day two and day three of the tournament at Lana Zepp, uh doing something which is, you know, which for which he has deniability, right? Something which may seem to be sort of by the letter of what is acceptable, and yet the spirit isn't right. Ex very explicitly in day two when he's actually lying, caught in a lie, Right, uh, by Isolde herself, um, but yet still brazens it out, lies to her face, though he knows that she knows that he's lying, right? Um, but he's stuck with it. Uh, and, and on day three, it's the same thing, especially following day two and what happened in day two, right? It's very clear to everybody. And so at the very end, um, and so at the very end, we have... The, we ended with the uh, the scene where he is. Well, sorry, there we go. We ended with the scene where he is um, shouting uh, at the tent, right? As he is uh, uh, with the King of Ireland, the King of North Wales, and being uh, taken away. Um, you know, he's been weeping and wailing, right, in his own despair, uh, knowing what he did, knowing the consequences of his action. And he goes by the pavilion of Sir Tristram, the pavilion where he had been staying with them, right? Um, and he starts shouting at Tristram. And remember, they're calling from inside, like, yo, hey, Palomides, right? You know, come and join us. Where, where you been, right? Um, there's obviously no malice there. There's no... Um, uh, there's no resentment on Tristram's side. Um, Tristram doesn't clearly doesn't really feel betrayed, even though he kind of has been betrayed. Uh, yet um, he doesn't feel betrayed, right? He doesn't act like he's been betrayed. Um, and Palamides starts screaming accusations at him, right? Calling him a traitor knight and uh, saying that if it were daylight, he would kill him right now with his own hands. Uh, and of course, we know that Tristram has not done any traitorous thing to Sir Palamides. Um, that was the, uh, the slide that I subtitled Shame and the Anger of the Shame. Um, you can see that his rage is directed primarily, uh, th though he's directing it at Tristram, right? Uh, because that's kind of always got now, uh, right? That's sort of the, it's the choice that he made when he parted uh, from the fellowship of 
uh, not only Sir Tristram, but Sir Gareth and Sir Dinadin. And Sir Gareth and Sir Dinadin, right? I mean, there are no two knights in all of Arthur's court who more clearly represent, like, friendship and faithfulness and, you know, uh, uh, the... Uh, delight in the company of good knights, right, uh, than Sir Gareth and Sir Dinadin. Um, so, like, any time you are deliberately distancing yourself from people that Sir Dinadin and Sir Gareth are, 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 are clinging to, you should probably examine your actions, you know, uh, probably. Um, anyway, yeah, yeah. Um, interesting. Both Stephen and Carita are, are saying it sounds almost, it, it's, it sounds like he's drunk, Right. Um, yes, he is sort of that far out of control at that point. Right. He's not really in his own mind, um, not because he's drunk, but just just because he is uh, himself out of his own um, out of his uh, it just he's just off his head. Right. With uh, with rage and anger at himself, but which he's channeling at Sir Tristram. And it's clear that all of those accusations, I mean, all those accusations of traitor knight um uh, and the accusations that Tristram has betrayed him are so poignantly and bitterly ironic, right? Um, so obviously descriptive of his own actions, not Sir Tristram's actions. And of course, we know that he himself is clearly aware of this, as we see right away. Um, immediately after he's been railing at Sir Tristram, and Sir Palamides rode with the tall kingas, and ever he made the greatest dole that any man could think. For he was not all only so dolorous for the departing from La Belle Isode, but he was as sorrowful to par uh, apart to go from the fellowship of Sir Tristram. For he was so kind and so gentle that once Sir Palamides remembered him thereof, he meeked never be merry. Um, I like the way that... Um, uh, Mallory is uh, essentially um, that Mallory is essentially uh, sort of assuming that we're going to make a false assumption here, right? Um, you know, he sort of starts off saying, uh, you know, he's he's he as he goes away, he's super sad, right? Not only for the, the departing from. La Belle Isode, right? It's almost like he's anticipating that his readers are going to be like, oh, yeah, because he's in love with La Belle Isode, and he's now being separated from the La Belle Isode, and the last he talked to her, she was, like, really mad with him and totally harsh on him, and, and you know, he feels that he's been shamed in her eyes, and he's totally right about that. Um, but, of course, Mallory immediately comes in and emphasizes, yeah, but it's not just that, right? Um, this is... It's also about the fellowship from Sir Tristram, right? And this is the uh, the irony of the whole thing, that Tristram is his great rival, right? And he can't let it go. Um, he can't stop measuring himself against Sir Tristram. He can't, you know, uh, Tristram is his rival and everything. Um, and he can't let it go. And yet he really likes Sir Tristram. He really enjoys Sir Tristram's company. And as he's leaving... It's not just the separation from La Belle Isode, but the, the separation from Tristram himself, uh, his deadly rival whom he hates more than anyone uh, and has challenged to a fight to the death again, right, um, is the one that uh, he, you know, whose, whose fellowship he is uh, so sorry to, so sorry to leave. Um, yeah. Yeah, and uh, and David, absolutely, Tristram's kindness makes it even harder for Palamides to bear his own shame. Uh, yeah, it really, it really, um, uh, it really rubs it in. Dolores Stokes says, at least he's not running into the woods naked. You know, I think like, but for the King of Ireland, he might have been right. If the if uh, if those two kings hadn't happened by him at that point, right, uh, a little nudity and running through the trees might have been uh, the next step. Right. Uh, for Palamides, as we saw when he's yelling at Tristram, he's barely in a better condition than that. Right. Um, and Tarlonio, I agree. Palamides can't seem to break out of this rut. Like no matter what he does, he keeps coming back to this. Um, 
uh, you know, coming in second. Um, and remember what I said last time about how he won the Gris right on the first day of the tournament at Lana Zepp, which is like the, the huge thing, right? The, you know, his best day ever. Uh, the one day when he won the prize, when both Tristram and Lancelot were both in the field, as he had never done in his entire life. Um, but that didn't fix things, right? Uh, he achieved what he had always wanted to, to achieve, but it clearly wasn't enough, right? It wasn't enough to break him out of that rut. That's um, actually winning was not the solution. Queen Guinevere, who, remember, wasn't there, right, because she was sick, uh, comes across with the moral observation, right, on this. Um, she's asking for a report, right? Well, said Queen Guinevere, who did bet all three dies? So God may help, said these knictes. Sir Launcelot and Sir Tristram had their least dishonor. <laughs> okay, uh, that's a very positive way to express it. And wit you well, Sir Palamides did passingly well and meekly, but he turned against the party that he come in withal, and that caused him to lose a great part of his worship, for it seemed that Sir Palamides is passing envious. Than shall he never win worship, sighed the queen. For, and it happened, an envious man, honest to win worship, he shall be dishonoured twice, therefore. And for this cows, all men of worship hot an envious man, and will show him no favour. And he that is courteous and kind and gentle hath favour in every place. Now, Queen Guinevere is not always the source of very deep moral wisdom, but this is pretty good. Right. Notice, of course, how exactly spot on she is. You can kind of hear, I think, here that Mallory is giving to Queen Guinevere here the moral reflection that I think we're really supposed to have on the Tournament of Lona Zepp. Right. Um, and notice how she even has the ratios exactly right. Um, and it happened an envious man to on honest to win worship, as Palamides did on day one. He shall be dishonored twice, therefore, as he was on days two and three, right? Um, that's the way of envy. You might even win sometimes, right? And it might, in that moment, look like it was all worth it, right? All of that striving, all of that discontent, all of that, uh, you know, determination, finally to make your mark and get what's belonging to you, right? The honor the, and, and recognition, right? That's, that's due to you. It might seem, perhaps, briefly, in that moment, like Sir Palamides' moment on day one, like it's all been worth it, right? But it's not going to be, right? Because that's not how it's going to work out. If you get there once, there are going to be two other occasions on which your envy is going to drive you to dishonor, um, as, of course, happens. Um, and notice the application. She doesn't make the application there explicitly. Um, in fact, she doesn't... I think, know fully the significance of what she's saying there. All, she's just responding to the observation that Sir Palamides is passing envious, right? Uh, it is unclear to me that Guinevere, that Guinevere really knows the full um, sort of nuances of the situation with Palamides and Tristram, right? And yet you look at what she says there and it is obviously very directly relevant. An envious man... Uh, so all men of worship hot an envious man and will show him no favor. And he that is courteous and kind and gentle hath favor in every place. At the end of the day, Palamides' problem is not that he's always second best, right? I mean, that's a mis it's a, it's a difficulty, right? It's a severe temptation, for him, it creates a severe temptation, the temptation to envy, right? But his envy itself is what is holding him back. Um, it's not being second that, uh, that makes him struggle the way that he does, right? It is being envious about being second. Notice, of course, Sir Gareth and uh, neither Sir Gareth nor Sir Dinadin can compete with Sir Tristram either, right? They don't try, but they couldn't. Sir Tristram would beat them pretty much every time, too, right? I mean, Gareth is very good, as we saw, but he's, he's not on Tristram's level, right? Palamides is closer, but he can't beat him either. But again, that's not the point, right? These two men, 
uh, these two theoretical men whom Guinevere describes at the end, the envious man and, you know, the one that is courteous and kind and gentle, kind of like, wait a second, kind of like uh, uh, he was so kind and so gentle. Yeah, kind of like that. Um, it, she, right, it sounds exactly like she's describing Palamides and Sir Tristram. Why does Sir Tristram always win? It's not about the winning with strength. That's not what's important. The reason that Sir Tristram is like has the moral high ground here is that instead of being envious, uh, he is kind and gentle. And you might say, of course, uh, you know, it's easy enough for Tristram not to be envious, right? He's got all the things, right? He's got his lady. He, you know, always beats Sir Palamides. Um, but Actually, that's not true, right? Sir Tristram could totally be envious if he wanted to be envious, right? Uh, there's, there's, there's plenty of material there, right? He could fixate on Lancelot like Sir Palamides fixates on him. That's totally possible. So Lancelot's better than he is, right? They're pretty close. They're in the same league. Um, but if push came to shove, Lancelot would take him. He's taken him before. Um, so... You know, I, I, um, again, it's uh, um, this is the moral lesson. Tristram's victory, in as much as he wins a victory here, is the moral victory. Which, Corita, I know sounds weird, right? But it is the moral victory. His courtesy, kindness, and gentleness Um is what wins him the moral victory that he chooses that. Even, again, even like the way that he treats Palamides, the way that he's been treating Palamides, uh, is really the victory there. Um, Matthew, exactly. Tristram doesn't seem to be upset that he's number two to Lancelot, right? From the very beginning, he was lo he loved Sir Lancelot long before they met. He didn't see him as a rival. He wasn't personally threatened by Sir Lancelot. Everybody could be like, oh, Sir Lancelot's the number one knight in the country. And he'd be like, yeah, he's awesome. I hear he's so awesome. I want to be BFFs with him, right? Let's be pen pals, Sir Lancelot, right? That's been his attitude from the very beginning. And that is a very admirable attitude from Tristram, right? We can't take for granted the fact that Tristram isn't envious. Like I said, he's got plenty of opportunity to be envious if he wanted to be, but he doesn't. Um, exactly, David. He became a fanboy instead of uh, being envious. And that is totally better. Absolutely better. Um, Tomas asks, is it ever ma made clear who is the most beautiful, Guinevere or Isolde? Well, it's hard because we rarely get a fully objective statement to that effect. Um, you know, both um, both have their uh, uh, both have their partisans, <laughs> right? Um, and of course, we'll get some uh, um, we'll get some interesting comparisons with Elaine uh, in a little bit too. But um, yeah, yeah. Um, now, Nancy, let's come back to this question. Nancy says uh, that it's something she struggles with as a modern reader because striving to be a, as good a knight as he can uh, is bad for him. You know, ambition and envy are really deeply intertwined in this idea here. Yeah, and that's what... So, Nancy, kind of two things I'd say there. One, you are absolutely right. That, and this is why, as I was arguing last time, envy is the absolutely... It's sort of like the endemic sin, right? That's the real snare. It's not exactly pride. It's envy specifically, right? Um, that the danger of envy is definitely built into this system where you're trying to prove yourself and you're trying to win worship and you prove yourself through competition with others, right? And if they beat you, you you can be resentful and envious of their success and upset about your own loss and hope to get them back and take revenge and, uh, uh, you know, give them their comeuppance or see them, uh, you know, contrive to uh, uh, heap disworship upon them, right, in order to pay them back for what they did to you. I mean, there are all kinds of pitfalls for that, right? It is super easy to fall into that uh, moral error, right? And yet it is clearly a moral error. Trying to do your best and to be your best, trying to win worship. Trying to win worship is not bad, right? That's not a sin. I, within Maori's world, that seems to be not a sin at all. I don't, I don't see any indication uh, of any kind that there's anything morally questionable about that in itself. But um, 
the thing that you have to do. And again, that, that, that to me, one of the best examples we had of this was Sir Lamarack. Uh, and I made this argument before. Now, he wasn't perfect, right? There was that whole uh, uh, drinking horn of chastity thing that he did at Cornwall, right? Which was not so great. And, um, you know, he had a couple moments, Sir Lamarack did. And yet, what we saw out of Sir Lamarack again and again was what I was, what I was calling humility, right, at the time. Um, but it's also... Um, yeah, you know, very much the sort of the opposite of this kind of envy, right? He didn't grudge anyone. He would g- give other. He would give others opportunity to win worship and 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 lose those opportunities himself very willingly. Uh, he would give credit to others uh, even uh, at the expense of credit that should go to himself, right? He was not against proving himself. He was not running contrary to the culture, and yet we saw this very consistent lack of envy in Lamarack as well, which again was pretty remarkable because he is right up there on that upper echelon. Um, really the only other one who's ever described as actually being in Tristram and, La- and Lancelot's league, really. Uh, I mean, there's, you know, th- there's the rankings, but after, after three, you know, after Lamarack, there's a, there's a drop. Palamides is kind of the only one who's really sort of on the cusp, right, of being, uh, of being in that top league. But anyway, uh, Sir Lamarack, Again, not um, not envious, right? Uh, never crosses that particular line. So it's it it can be tricky, but it's mostly about how one is focused on others, right? And it's okay to seek your own worship, but if you are hoping for other people to fail, if you're contriving for other people to fail, if you're trying to bring shame upon other people, that's then you're sinning, right? That's that's envy. That's bad. If you are, uh, um, uh, you know, gnawing your tongue with frustration and anger when someone else does well and uh, wins worship, again, that's that's your bad sign, right? You know that uh, you're doing it wrong. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, Gerald says, doing your best and accepting the result is different from being envious of the success of others. Absolutely. Absolutely. Doing your best and even, again, in this context, doing your best and wanting to be uh, acknowledged as the best, right? That's that's good. That's fine. So yeah, Palamides wanting to measure himself against Tristram and Lancelot and striving to be recognized as, as you know, in their league. Um, nothing wrong with that. It's you know, all those other things that he gets caught up in. Um, yeah, yeah. Okay. Let's keep going. Palamides soon after runs into Sir Epinogris. Uh, and Sir Epinogris is in the woods complaining Right. He's uh, he's upset. So Palamides finds uh, Sir Epinogris, who's really upset. So he sits down. And he's like, hey, let's complain together. <laughs> right. We've all been there. Right. Uh, you know, with somebody uh, having a conversation that goes almost exactly like this. Right. Where you're like, well, let me tell you about how miserable my wife is. And then the other person is like, oh, that's nothing. My wife is way worse than yours. Right. Uh, and then you get like the envying and vying about who's more miserable and in a worse condition. Right. Um, uh, as I said, I think we've all been there before, right? And that's where Sir Palamides and Sir Epinogris end up going. Anyway, so he's just, you know, told about how he's in love with uh, La Belle Zode and he can't ever, uh, you know, get anything, uh, hap- have you competitive commiserating, James? It's exactly it. Um, yeah. Okay. That is great folly, said Sir Epinogris, for to love Queen Isode. For all of the best connectors of the world loveth her, that is Tristram de Lyonnais. That is truth, sighed Sir Palamides, for no man knoweth that matter better than I do. <laughs> I love that sentence. Yeah, yeah, don't have to tell me that, friend. For I have been in Sir Tristram's fellowship this month and more, and with La Belle Isode togethers. And alas, sighed Sir Palamides, unhappy man that I am, now have I lost the fellowship of Sir Tristram and the love of La Belle Isode forever, and I am never likely to see her more, 
and Sir Tristram and I been either to other mortal enemies. Well, sighed Sir Epinogris, sith that ye loved La Belle Isode, loved she ever you again, by anything that you could wit? Other Ellis did ye ever rejoice her on any pleasure? Nay, be me knight, knichtod, said Sir Palamides, for I never espied that ever she loved me more than all the world did. did. Nor never had I pleasure with her, but the last day she gaff me the greatest rebuke that ever I had, which shall never go from my heart. And yet I well deserved the rebuke, for I did not knickly, and therefore I have lost the love of her and of Sir Tristram for ever. And I have many times enforced myself to do many deeds of armies for her sack, and ever she was the causer of my worship winning, and alas, now I have I lost all the worship that ever I won, for never shall befall me such prowess as I had in the fellowship of Sir Tristram. Notice one of the things that we get a glimpse of here, right? This, of course, is Sir Palamides' confession. On the one hand, we can see this is this is good. It's good that he's processing, right? It's good that he's working through this. We see him being totally honest with himself and with Sir Epinogris here, unlike how he was trying to deceive the others, at least, and himself, perhaps, even to some extent, right, uh, during the tournament of Lanazep, and we see him turning away from that. But more, the thing that it is to me most poignant about this description here at the end is this glimpse, I think, of what might have been, right? What would an unenvious Palamides look like? What might his life have been? Because it's easy enough to say, okay, you know, sure, his attitude is is not great and kind of self-destructive, um, as we saw at the Tournament of Lana Zep, sure, but, I mean, the man has been dealt a pretty bad hand, right? I mean, you know, his the lady that he loves is in love with the one guy who always beats him, and I mean, who could, you know, it would take superhuman virtue, right, to not get a little upset in that kind of a situation. Um, but look at what he describes. Right. Um, I have many, t- many times enforced myself to do many deeds of armies for her sack, and ever she was the causer of my worship winning, and alas, now have I lost all the worship that ever I won, for never shall befall me such prowess as I had in the fellowship of Sir Tristram. He acknowledges here, and I think this is the first time he has said this out loud, right? On the one hand, yeah. He's number four at best, right? He's no, he's no better than the fourth best knight in the world. He's never going to be better than the fourth best knight in the world. That's his spot, right? But had Sir Tristram not been, had he not been in the company of Sir Tristram, had Sir Tristram not been there for him to continually compete with and push himself against, would he even be number four, Right? Never shall befall me such prowess as I had, not for the sake of La Belle Isode, but for the f- in the fellowship of Sir Tristram. When he is with Sir Tristram, he is a much better knight than he is when he is on his own, right? Um, and again, there's this sense of the difference between like the good version and the bad version of Palamides and Tristram's relationship is very subtle. Right. They should be challenging each other. Right. They should be measuring themselves against each other. He should be pushing himself to be as good as Sir Tristram because he's close, man. Right. He's close. He's not going to be like Sir Dinadin being like, oh, whatever. I'm just going to make sarcastic comments about fighting and I'm never going to be as good as you, even though Sir Dinadin is probably top ten. Right. Um, But nevertheless, like he's not just going to resign himself to that. Um, but there would be a positive version of this, right? If he were BFFs with Sir Tristram in the same way that Tristram sought out to be BFFs uh, with Lancelot, right? There is a world in which he, Palamides, could be close in friendship with both Tristram and La Belle Isote, right? And could uh, do great deeds for 
you know, inspired by La Belle Isode and could, you know, have this healthy, friendly competition with Tristram that would continue to push and drive Sir Palamides throughout his career. It is totally possible for that to have happened. It fit. There is a world in which that could happen, in which that fits, right? But he can't do it. He could never do it. He has been definitely his own worst enemy, Jennifer, uh, as far as worship and love go. Absolutely. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, Stephen, that's a really good way of thinking about it. He should be trying to pull himself up to Tristram's level, not trying to ch tear Tristram down below him. Yes, yes, good. That's a, that's a really great way of characterizing the non-envious competition and the envious competition, right? Um, uh Yes, yes. Uh, holding Tristram as like an ideal to which he is aspiring, actively aspiring. Um, that would be good, right? Th that would be that would be that would be excellent. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, Nancy, I missed your comment after I was reading uh, Sir Palamides' complaint where she said, but tell the young people <laughs> today about that and they won't believe you. Uh, uh, Nancy, that is my favorite Monty Python sketch, I think, of all time. The Four Yorkshiremen, I think, is my absolute number one. Um, oh, my goodness. Anyway, um, yeah, the tragedy of Palamides. Um, then Palamides is captured, right? And he's captured just like Tristram was, right? After the, uh, wasn't it the, the Castle of Maidens tournament uh, where Tristram got captured by the dude whose three sons he killed, right? So Sir Palamides is captured by somebody who's like brother or son, I can't even remember which, uh, Palamides killed in the tournament, which is totally true, but, you know, not exactly Sir Palamides' fault. And Sir Palamides is sentenced to death. His brother, Sir Safir, is uh, uh, pardoned, right? He's, uh, uh, he's acquitted, actually, at the trial. Uh, but Sir Palamides is condemned to death, and so he's led off uh, to death. Um, but of course, they lead him right past Joy's guard, right, where uh, uh, he is spotted from a distance and Sir Tristram learns that Sir Palamides is being marched off to his death. Now, Sir Tristram has not had any interactions with Sir Palamides since the tournament at Lama Zep, right? Since, uh, you know, he, Palamides, was last, like, dragged off into the darkness, uh, uh, screaming irrational imprecations at Tristram. Um, and yet, Tristram... Uh, says that he's um, uh, he's going to go rescue him, right? Uh, now, of course, by the time he gets there, Sir Lancelot has already rescued him, right? So uh, technically, Sir Tristram doesn't rescue him, but it's the thought that counts, right? And Thon was Sir Palamides, war of Sir Tristram, how he come riding. And when Sir Lancelot saw him, he knew him well, but Sir Tristram knew not him, because he had on his shoulder a golden shield. So Sir Lancelot mod him ready to just with Sir Tristram, because he should not ween that he were Sir Lancelot. Then Sir Palamides cried on loud to Sir Tristram and sighed, Ah, my lord, I require you, just not with this knicked, for he hath savoured me from my death. When Sir Tristram heard him say so, he come a soft trotting pass toward him, and Than Sir Palamides sighed, my lord, Sir Tristram, much am I beholding unto you of your great goodness, that will proffer your noble body to rescue me undeserved, for I have greatly offended you. Notwithstanding, sighed Sir Palamides, here met we with this noble knicht that worshipfully and manly rescued me from twelve knichtes, and smote them down all and sore wounded him. Okay, so there's this other dude that we should be thankful for, but... Um, much am I beholding unto you of your great goodness. And it is great goodness. This is a great moment for Tristram, really. His decision, uh, the pity that he shows on Sir Palamides here, right? He's like, it's no, no, no knight who is as good a knight as Sir Palamides uh, should be going off to a traitor's death like that. That's not right. Even though Sir Palamides has, you know, not been the best of friends to me, uh, nevertheless, I can't 
I can't let that I can't let that pass. Um, uh, so Palamides now once again very forcibly confronted with the friendship of Sir Tristram. And notice one of the things that is very noticeable here from now on, we will not see Sir Palamides interact with La Belle Isoude ever again, right? The whole end of the Palamides story as Mallory gives it to us is focused entirely on Tristram and Palamides. That's the relationship that really matters, right? Tristan and Isoude, that's a thing, okay? Like, there's no getting between that. Um, there's no making any drama out of that. It's not a real love triangle at all, and Maori's not trying to depict it like it's a real love triangle, right? Um, the friendship of Sir Palamides and Sir Tristram is the thing that really matters. This is totally a bromance, uh, and there is um, there are no two ways about that. But now we get the final complication of the bro of the bromance. We have heard that um, uh, there's several people, including Dinadin, at the tournament of Lana Zep, right, sort of under his breath, uh, that he knows that Palamides loves La Belle Isoude. In fact, like, everybody knows that Palamides loves La Belle Isoude, except for Sir Tristram, right? Except for Captain Oblivious. Uh, so, uh, and several people have suggested, both Lancelot and Sir Dinadin at the tournament suggested that if Tristram found out that Palamides uh, was in love with La Belle Isoude, things might get kind of uh, ugly, right? So, to this point, for a while now, it has been good Tristram, gentle, kind, generous Tristram, and envious Sir Palamides. Um, again, like the the Guinevere's good example and bad example, one of whom is Tristram, the other of whom is Palamides, right? It seemed, uh, for a while, it has slipped into what has looked like a kind of a black and white situation. But, of course, as we can... Uh, as we can uh, well remember, right, Sir Tristram has not always been a perfect moral exemplar, right? Uh, and so it shouldn't surprise us that Sir Tristram still has a couple not perfect moral moments in store for us. So Sir Palamides is, is staying with him at Joyous Guard again, right? And he is kind of wasting away and he's off lying by a well, like you do, singing a song at the top of his voice, like you do, uh, which is a song that he composed about his <laughs> love for La Belle Isoud. So, like, okay. Singing a song about yourself and your love for your friend's girlfriend and singing it really loud near where your friend lives, not... Uh, highly recommended, really. Um, <laughs> but anyway, uh, Tristram overhears, right? <laughs> he sits there in the bushes until he hears. He comes in, in the middle of Sir Palamides' song, lets him go back to the beginning and start again and sing it all the way through. And then he's like, all right, okay. Uh, and now, all of a sudden, Trist Tristram is betrayed, right? Oh, no, he now has found out what everybody else knows. Sir Palamides, I have heard your complaint and of your treason that you have owed me long, and wit you well, therefore ye shall die. And if it were not sham of knighthood, thou shouldest not escape my hundes, for knew I knew well thou hast awaited me with treason. And therefore, said Sir Tristram, tell me how thou wilt acquit thee. Sir, I shall acquit me thus. As for Queen La Belle Isoude, thou shalt wit that I love her above an other laddies in this world. And well I wot, it shall befall by me as for her love, as befell on the noble Knecht Sir Cahydens, that died for the love of La Belle Isoude. And now, Sir Tristram, I wall that ye wit that I have loved La Belle Isoude many a long day, and she hath been the causer of my worship. And Ellis, I had been the most simplest knight in the world, for by her and because of her I have won the worship that I have. For when I remembered me of Queen Isode, I won the worship wheresomever I come, for the most party. 
for the most party, right? A little, a little honest addition there. And yet I had never reward another bounty of her dies of my life. And yet I have been her knicked long guerdonless. And therefore, Sir Tristram, as for any death I dread not, for I had as lief die as live. And if I were armed as ye are, I should leakly do battle with thee. All right. Let's unpack this uh, a little bit here. Um. <laughs> Karina's wondering, was this really a thing? Did people really just monologue? Like, did they really lie next to wells and 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 uh, 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 sing <laughs> songs, uh, sing, uh, uh, you know, exposés about their own private lives? Um, uh yeah, yes, Gerald Michaels is suggesting that Palamides is singing approximately I Wish That I Had Tristram's Girl. Yes, yes. Uh, uh, how can I find a woman like that? That's that's pretty much it. Yep. Um, uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, now, Nancy, good. I agree. I think that's a really perceptive point. Nancy points out that it's not exactly the loud singing is a mistake independently so much as it's him just not caring anymore. Yes, for I had as leaf die as live. I think he's been kind of saying that the whole time, like the whole time he's lying there singing. Um, this is the last thing between the two of them, right? They've made up kind of made up, right? The whole you came out to, to fight 12 men in order to save my life is, has kind of helped patch things between them, but there's this one the one thing, right? The one thing that is still secret and the fact that, oh gosh Palamides has given it away by accidentally singing it really loud where everybody could hear uh, kind of, uh, it, it does fit Nancy, I think, with his statement that he would as leaf die as live um, yeah yeah. Um, uh, now, uh, uh, David. Okay, so David, um, guard, uh, guardenless. Uh, a guarden is a reward. So I have been her night long without guarden. That is without any reward. I've never gotten anything from her, right? Um, she has never given me anything by which he doesn't, you know. Your guerdon for something would often be like an actual material gift, right? She's never given me a gift, but of course, more importantly, she's never given me anything intangible or like tangible in a different way, if you know what I mean. Uh, so, yeah, no, he's never had any kind of reward or encouragement or like he's never received any positive feedback from his old at all, which is what he's emphasizing in that whole sentence. I have... I had never reward nor bounty of her. So notice those two things, reward or bounty. Reward means when you're, it's, that's a guerdon, right? When you're given something in exchange for something that you've done, uh, to recognize something, acknowledge something you've done. Bounty is just a gift, right? When you just give somebody a present because, you know, you're being generous, right? They haven't earned it, but you just give it to them because you can. Um, he's not received either kind of thing uh, from uh, Isolde of any kind, days of his life. Um, and yet, despite the fact that his long service of her has been completely uh, uh, without any payoff of any kind, uh, nevertheless, he has been her knight. Um, yeah. Okay. So, yeah. Um, now, Several of you are asking, what's his problem, Tristram's problem here, right? He is accusing um, Palamides of treason here. Um, why? What's the problem? Um, and now I agree, if someone else loves your lady, um, that's nothing to be upset about, right? Remember, we've had an example of this already. Um, remember when Lancelot came in and found Meliagant and Lamorak fighting about who is more beautiful, Guinevere or Morgoz, right? His reaction, Lancelot's reaction, was not, 
Meligant, how dare you fight for Guinevere, right? And defend her beauty. His uh, reaction was all against Lamarack, right? What? Morgoth's more beautiful than Guinevere? Step aside, Meligant, I got this, right? Um, so, I mean, the idea that someone else could admire your lady seems to be, if Lancelot is a measure, and generally he is a standard, uh, then uh, that seems to be not intrinsically or necessarily a big deal, right? Um, well, or perhaps we should say at least it isn't for Lancelot, right? Um, a couple things that this makes me wonder. Thing number one. Does he, when he hears Palamides saying things like, Oh, I love La Belle Isode. La Belle Isode is like, you know, she's so fine, she blows my mind, and, uh, you know, and like I am her devoted knight. What does he hear, right? Is he. What I'm coming back to is this whole question of, like, there's love and then love, if you know what I mean, right? Um, Lancelot loves Guinevere, but are Lancelot and Guinevere, you know, right? Um, there's love and then there's love par amours. To Lancelot, there's a big difference. And remember, very recently, we've been reminded by Sir Percival that he sees a big difference, too. Right? It's not only Lancelot who sort of freakishly looks at it this way. Um, Sir Percival, Captain Innocent, is totally uh, uh, on board with loving Sinless. Right? Tristram, as we've seen, has never really been into the whole Sinless love thing. Right? Love has always kind of meant hopping into bed to Tristram. Pretty much without exception. Right? Even like being having kindly feelings towards of like gratitude and cheerfulness right as with Isode Le Blanchemans ended up with him in her bed married right admittedly right and you know he stopped short of home base right uh, so it was a near thing but nevertheless there he was in her bed clipping and kissing right um so, uh, I wonder. So, so here's, here's the thing that I'm wondering. When he hears Sir Palamides boasting of his love for La Belle Isode, is he translating that? Is, is, does this sound like Sir Palamides is boasting that he's sleeping with La Belle Isode, right? It doesn't need to be that Sir Tristram believes that it's true, Right but that he, Palamides, would be a traitor for, like, going around saying that or implying that he was her lover, right? Um, that's one way, I think, that we can understand that, and it seems to me to kind of fit with Tristram that he is kind of leaping to a conclusion here, right? And, I, again, I don't think necessarily he is leaping to the conclusion that Isode is being unfaithful to him with Palamides, right? I don't think he believes that. Um, but I think that he does... I think it's at least very likely that he does believe that Palamides is claiming that, right? Is going around saying that. Um, and now he's only just now hearing of it and uh, is upset about that. That kind of thing Lancelot would probably be upset about too, right? Um, and so, therefore, one of the answers that I would give to those of you who are saying, like, why is this such a big deal? What is Tristram on about? Um... That's one of my answers that I would give to that. Because there is this fuzziness, right, about what does love mean when you say, I love this lady, right? Um, what are you saying, right? When you say, La Belle Isode is my beloved. It's like, okay, so what are you saying, Palamides, right? And other people might have doubts about that too, right? I mean, if he goes about saying that she's his beloved, everyone else is going to be like, oh, uh -huh. okay, I guess so, right? Um, 
uh, yeah, so Karina, it's not exactly, I think, about Palamides' desires. It's about... I don't know, what, relationship status? <laughs> that's, that's not quite right. But something like that. Um, again, in the current sort of state of the culture of love in the Arthurian world, as Maori has described it, this kind of confusion of sinless love versus carnal uh, love par amours, it's, un- you know, the meaning is uncertain. If you go around saying that you are this lady's lover, what does that mean, right? And so Tristram is not down with Palamides going around singing songs about how he is, you know, the ardent lover of La Belle Isode, right? That's one answer. That is, I'm not saying that it's um, the only answer, but that's that's one thing. And Karina, you're absolutely right. There's love, and then there's love is indeed like this whole book. Absolutely. Um, absolutely. Um, so is Tristram essentially concerned about public perception? In part, yes, I think so. Uh, because it would have an impact on Isode's honor as well. Because, you know, she should only be committing adultery with one person at a time, for crying out loud. Um, <laughs> I know, it's, I know, I know it seems weird to be worrying about, like, the reputation for chastity of an openly adulterous wife, as La Belle Isode really pretty much is now living with Sir Tristram in joyous guard in this. Yeah. Um, <laughs> committing adultery against King Mark doesn't really count. <laughs> okay. uh, if, uh, if there's ever that kind of an argument to be made, I would agree it would be in the case of King Mark, who seems barely like actually a human being at all, but nevertheless, <laughs> Technically, you know, you kind of can't get off, uh, can't, can't, can't uh, get let off on that. Um, anyway, but I said that was only one reading of that, of Tristram's uh, upsetness, right? Uh, and, no, and notice, by the way, actually, before I leave that, again, coming back to that guardenless sentence, right? One of the things that Palamides does very clearly is try to set the record straight about that. He's like, look, man, I have loved La Belle Isode always. She has done nothing for me. I am not claiming anything. I am claiming zero reciprocity at all, right? And yet, I've loved her, right? He has loved her sinlessly. It's all good. Um, yeah, and Jennifer, you're absolutely right. I mean one can't really be sympathetic for the jealous rage of Sir Tristram, uh, given his own record, <laughs> right? Uh, it's a little rich. Totally agree. Um, yeah, well, um, okay, I was going to say something else about it, though. What else What else was I going to say? Um, oh, well, the other thing I want to say I think, remember, the emphasis, I, th- I, I you know, my, my argument here is that the emphasis throughout, and especially here at the end, is chiefly on the relationship between Palamides and Tristram. And here, we've seen Palamides' own regrets. We've seen Palamides' own longing for Sir Tristram, acknowledgement that his friendship with Sir Tristram was really important and now has been marred. I, um... Uh, I think that here we're getting a glimpse of the same thing the other way around, right? Tristram likes Palamides, too. Uh, He enjoys Palamides' company. Um, He is saddened about the fact that Palamides can't let it go, right? And the the envy that continues to, to reverse the friendship between him and Palamides. Notice his reaction, part of his reaction at least, to hearing Palamides' protestations of love for La Belle Isode is, 
And if it were not for sham of knechthood, thou shouldest not escape my hondas, for now I know well thou hast awaited me with treason. And therefore tell me how thou wilt acquit thee. I know well thou hast awaited me with treason. Right? He's saying here, so you've had ulterior motives all along. Right? Um, I thought you were just obsessed with me. Now I learn that you're obsessed with my girlfriend. It wasn't ever about me, was it? It wasn't ever about me. You were always just interested in my girlfriend. Um, I think that's part of it here. I really do. Um, he has been the part of the awaiting me with treason, I believe, is the okay, you've had ulterior motives. You've uh, it's always been her, hasn't it? Um, Part of it is his own friendship with Palamides that, that this whole thing seems to call into question, right? Um, I th again, I think that he feels... I think that he feels the tragedy of the thwarted bromance here, too. Let's keep going. Let's jump forward. Um, we're going to jump forward... For the first time in quite a while, we're going to do some of these passages out of order because, of course, we shift back to Lancelot and Elaine and we get lots of Lancelot and Elaine and, and the whole like beginnings of the Holy Grail story. Uh, and then at the very end, we come back to Tristram and Palamides and I can't take it. So we're going to just jump straight to that and finish the Tristram and Palamides story. And then we'll jump back and do Lancelot and Elaine. Um, so... This is now jumping ahead. It is almost time for the big day. Um, there's going to be a great feast at Pentecost at King Arthur's court. Uh, rumors of big doings this year at the great feast. And uh, Tristram is super excited to go. Ah, Jesu, thereof am I fine, said Sir Tristram. And no shall ye and I mock us ready, for both ye and I will be at that feast. Sir, said Dame Isode, and it please you, I will not be there, for through me ye been marked of many good knictes, and that cowseth you for to have much more labor for my sack than needeth you to have. Then will I not be there, said Sir Tristram, but if ye be there. God defend, said La Belle Isode, for then shall I be spoken of sham among all queenes and ladies of a stat. So here La Belle Isode has to explain things to Captain Clueless, right? For ye that are called one of the noblest knictes of the world, and a knict of the rune table, how may ye be missed at that feast? For what shall be side of you among all knictes? Ah, see how Sir Tristram hunteth and hawketh and cowereth within a castle with his lady, and forsaketh us, alas! Some shall say, it is pity that ever he was knicked, for ever he shall have the love of a lady. Also, what queen, what shall queenes and ladies say of me? It is pity that I have my life, that I would hold so noble a knight as ye are from his worship. So God me help, said Sir Tristram unto La Belle Isode. It is passingly well said of you, and nobly consailed. And now I will understand that ye love me. And like as ye have counselled me, I will do a part thereafter. But there shall no man nor child ride with me but myself alone. And so I will ride on Tuesday next coming, and no more harness of war but my spear and my sword. Okay. So he's going to the... I love Isode's explanation, right? First of all, Isode's exp explanation is really cool because it shows sort of how the whole system works, right? Remember, we've had these kind of glimpses. Of, like, we know there's a, there's, a, there's a ladies' leaderboard as well, right? But we just don't... Ha we're not privy to it most of the time. La Belle Isode reveals it very clearly here, right? You need to go there for the sake of your worship, right? You can't be sitting back at home when great feasts are being held and great things are happening just so that you can hang out with me because then everyone's going to be like, oh, you know, why is Sir Tristram such a loser? And worse, they're going to say things about me, right? And she talks about her own reputation. It's going to hurt her own worship among the queens and ladies, right? They're going to be like, oh, man, it's it's a shame the way that Isode is, right? Keeping... An, a good knight like Sir Tristram tied to her apron strings. 
Karina, exactly. Then Tristram's like, wow, babe, you're so smart. That's exactly what he's like. So God me help, right? Wow, gosh, <laughs> thanks, honey. I would never have figured that out on my own. Uh, so off he's going to go um, after Isode laboriously explained things. Concerning which, uh, we're almost at the end of La Belle Isode. But anyway. Okay, so Tristram, of course, riding with no armor and only his spear and sword, meets Sir Palamides, right? Now, so you remember after the whole singing by the fountain thing, they set a date, right? Two weeks down the road. Palamides is like, I got to get into shape. I, I need, I, I got two weeks. Give me two weeks to do like a training montage and then I'll be ready, right? In two weeks. Uh, and Tristram's like, you're on, man. And then he has that tragic hunting wound, right? When he gets shot through the thigh with an arrow and he can barely stand and he's really mad because he can't meet Sir Palamides. And so their final duel is thwarted again. So when he, without his armor, but with his spear and his sword, meets Sir Palamides fully armed, right? He rides on him and he breaks his spear on Palamides' shield. Tristram has no armor or shield of his own, right? But he's going with great woodness, the narrator tells us, right? And he, he uh, thwangs Palamides on the helmet five times, right, with his sword. And Palamides is not fighting back because Tristram is completely unarmed, by which it means no armor, right? No armor and no shield. Um, and Sir Tristram starts calling him a coward for not fighting him, Right? Sir, I put a cuss, said Sir Palamides, that ye were armed all at Richtes as well as I am, and I knocked as ye be. What would ye do to me now, be your true knichthood? Ah, sighed Sir Tristram, now I understand thee well, Sir Palamides, for now must I say my own judgment. You got to be patient with Sir Tristram. You got to kind of lead him to the point very deliberately. It can take a little while, but eventually he'll get there. And as God may bliss, that I shall see, uh, that I shall see, shall not be said, that I shall say, sorry, shall not be said, for no fear that I have of thee, Sir Palamides. But this is all. Wit thou well, Sir Palamides, that at this time thou shalt just depart from me, for I will not have ado with thee. No more will I, said Sir Palamides, and therefore ride forth on thy way. As for that, sighed Sir Tristram, I may choose other to ride, other to go. But, Sir Palamides, said Sir Tristram, I marvile greatly of own thing, that thou art so good a knight, and that thou wilt not be christened, and thy brother Sir Saphir hath been christened many a day. As for that, sighed Sir Palamides, I may not yet be christened for a vow that I have made many years agone. Howbeit in my heart and in my soul I have had many a day a good believe in Jesu Christ and his mild motor Mary, but I have but own battle to do, and where that on is done I would be baptized. He's one battle short of fulfilling his vow. Be my head, sighed Sir Tristram, as for on battle, thou shalt not seek it long, for God defend, sighed Sir Tristram, that through my default thou shouldest linger live thus a Saracen. For yonder is a knight that ye have hurt and smitten down. Now help me, than that I were armed in his armour, and I shall soon fulfil thine avowers. As ye will, sighed Sir Palamides, so shall it be. Okay, so... Um... <laughs> <laughs> Karina wants Tristram to say again, wow, babe, you're so smart. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, Nancy, an excellent point. Nancy points out that that's two people in a row trying to teach Sir Tristram to consider someone else's point of view. Yeah, and Sir Palamides has to literally break it down for, for him, right, Nancy? Like, okay, imagine, Sir Tristram, that you are in my position and I am in yours. What would you do? Oh, yeah, okay. No, but you're, you're absolutely right, Nancy. That is the common thread here, right? Um, and that, of course, seems to me to be a major part of the problem with Sir Tristram's reaction to Palamides' song, right? Um, he, uh, Sir Tristram never did, has never done 
what Palamides has done with La Belle Isode, right? He has loved La Belle Isode from a distance, without reward, without hope of reward, right? Without contriving for reward. Um, and yet he has been content to be inspired uh, by her, even when there seems potentially an element of self-deception in that, like we saw in the first day at the Tournament of Lama Zep, right? Um, but anyway, Tristram doesn't grok that at all, right? He just can't understand um, that attitude because that's not exactly been his approach whenever he has been in love with a lady. Again, uh, there's been a pretty much a one-to-one -one correlation between Tristram falling in love with someone and getting into her bed. So, you know, he doesn't get it, right? Um, but Nancy, as you say, he's being taught to consider things from other people's point of view. Now, the end of this. He's about to let him go. They're about to part again without fighting again. And he's like, you know, why, why won't you get baptized? Palamides, right? And Palamides repeats what we've heard him say before, that in his heart he's a Christian, um, uh, but uh, he won't until he finishes his vow to fight his seven battles. Now, what he, he said before seven battles for Jesus, I don't know what a battle for Jesus, what qualifies as a battle for Jesus exactly. He's apparently done six at this point, and he still has the one left to do. And Sir Tristram says, well, I'll fight you right now, and that'll count as number seven, and then you will fulfill your vow and get baptized. So let's fight to the death. If, if I kill you, you can be baptized afterwards. That's Sir Tristram's logic. But anyway, um, this is another one of those points where you could easily read this in a couple different ways, right? You could read Sir Tristram's words to Sir Palamides in a completely mocking way here, right? Oh, you you need one more battle? Oh, I can hook you up with one more battle, right? Uh, yeah, don't worry. You, you won't be... Again, you could take that whole, like, let's fight to the death and then you can baptize yourself afterwards as uh, being like a, 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 a cruel joke, right, on Tristram's part. But I don't think so. I don't think so. Um, this sounds more like a mode we've seen Tristram be in before. That is when Tristram is doing his sort of clueless, um, you know, wide-eyed like, hey, I have an idea, right? What if we did this? Um, kind of like when he was like, hey, 30 knights are li lying in ambush for Lancelot to kill him fighting 30 on one. So let's go and fight him 30 on two, because then we'll spring the trap and save Sir Lancelot. And Dinadin is like, have you done the math here? Right. Uh, anyway, um, we've seen him act in ways like this before. <laughs> Curry thinks that Tristram is too dumb to be sarcastic. <laughs> it's it's possible. It's possible. And Gerald, I agree. It seems at least as likely that the whole let's fight to the death first and then you can be baptized afterwards contradiction has probably not been fully thought through on Tristram's part. Um, now, you could also argue. Notice that Palamides doesn't say I have to do one more battle for Jesus' sake here. Um you could argue, that, well, maybe Mallory's kind of quietly dropping the battle for Jesus part of the vow and is just changing it into battles now at this point, or maybe he's forgotten what the original terms of it were. I don't think so. That is not my reading of this passage. I think that Mallory remembers and expects us to remember. I think that this battle is a battle for Jesus, right? This is a moral battle for Palamides, right? This is a big moment, um... And the one in which I think we're going to see him fighting a major, um, uh, fighting a major battle uh, of great spiritual significance here. Um, I agree. There's definitely has to be something special about the uh, fighting, right? He's clearly, as you say, had way more than six fights in his life before, right? So there, there has to be some kind of significance about them. And this is, um, um, this is definitely the, uh, 
uh, a significant battle, right? That counts as one of the great seven battles of his life. Um, so I agree with that, Nancy. Um, David, though, you are right. And I think this... David points out that, you know, the weird thing is he'd expect to be Trist Tristram to be the most highly intelligent of all the knights, you know, with his hunting inventions and mu musical education and, liter and literacy. Yeah. I mean, Tristram is supposed to be like the savant of all the knights, um, the, the, the most highly educated, the most sophisticated in many ways. Right. The dude writes books. Uh, yeah. Yeah. He is supposed to be the intellectual of the entire Arthurian court. But Mallory just can't seem to keep it. He keeps paying lip service to that, right? But the Tristram character that he's developed, that's not him, right? And I think that uh, here Tristram is fighting, a, or uh, Mallory is fighting a losing battle. Um, uh, now, it is possible, of course, that he, um, uh, as Stephen says, intelligence doesn't necessarily equal wisdom. And Gerald Michael is saying uh, uh, the same sort of thing. Uh, it is, it is, it is very possibly, uh, very possibly true. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. Being, uh, being very intelligent, but rather oblivious is certainly not unknown. Totally agree. Um, yeah. As Marilyn says, he's not exactly dumb. He's just not good at people. Yeah, no, not good at people is a pretty good description, I think, there. Um, yeah. Anyway, I think that the that the tone with which Tristram suggests that they go over to the knight that Talamides just beat up and get his armor, and then you can help put, put you know help dress me in his armor, and then we'll fight. Uh, that has that kind of touch of naivete, that kind of naivete that's not very good at seeing things from other people's point of view, right? Um, th that really leads me to believe that Tristram is not just being sarcastic here at all. Um, yeah. As ye will, so shall hit be. That's a really important sentence. As ye will, so shall hit be. What's important about that? Why should we sit up straight when we get to that sentence? Almost every time they've fought, it has been at Sir Palamides' will. Right? And remember Sir Palamides' rage. Remember his continual reversion to that envy, right? Reversion to that drive to constantly go back and 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 fight Tristram and take him down he's submitting here right he's not pushing it Palamides is okay he had that duel set up with Tristram right and Tristram couldn't keep it and he was fine with that Palamides was he was never fine with that kind of thing before Right? As ye will, so shall it be. And you are absolutely right, Carita, that we should also hear, especially in the context of his baptism, right, the way that he is echoing the kind of submission to Christ, right, that Christians are supposed to show. Um, not my will, but thine be done, right? Uh, he's sort of, um, in response to this proposition that will lead to his baptism, he responds with a paraphrasing of Jesus, right? That's pretty good, actually, right? But again, in this, in, in this context, with Palamides and Tristram, it's a huge, huge deal. As for to do this battle, sighed Sir Palamides, I dar reeked well, ain't it? So, uh, remember, they've been, so they, they fight and they, you know, uh, give each other many sad strokes and all that, right? They've been fighting for a really long time. As for to do this battle, said Sir Palamides, I dar reeked well end it, but I have no great loss to fight no more. And for this cows, said Sir Palamides, mine offence is to you not so great, but that we may be friendes. For all that I have offended is and was for the love of La Belle Isode. 
And as for her, I dare say she is as peerless of all other laddies, and also I proffered her never no manner of dishonor. And that is, I haven't been bragging of honor or anything like that or claiming something that I didn't have. And by her I have gotten the most part of my worship, and sith and I had offended never as to her own person, and as for the offence that I have done, it was against your own person. And for that offence ye have given me this die many sad strokes, and some I have given you again, and knew I dare say I felt never man of your meeked, nor their so well breathed, but if it were Sir Lancel Lancelot du Lac. Wherefore, I require you. No, he just slips a little praise for him in there, right? Man, you are the strongest knight I've ever fought. Did I, did I ever mention that? And wherefore, I require you, my lord, forgive me all that I have offended unto you, and this some die, have me to the next church, and first let me be clean confessed, and after that, see yourself that I be truly baptized. And then will we ride together unto the court of King Arthur, that we may be there at the next high feast following. Then tack your horse, said Sir Tristram, and as ye say, so shall it be. And all my evil will, God forgive it you, and I do. And the hereby, within this mile, is the suffragan of, Car of Carlisle, which shall give you the sacrament of baptima. A suffragan is a bishop, by the way. And anon they took their horses, and Sir Galeron, that is the knight that they that Sir Palamides beat up and whose armor Tristram has been wearing, and Sir Galeron rode with them, and when they come to the suffragan, Sir Tristram told him their desire. Than the suffragan let fill a great vessel with water, and one he had hallowed uh, and, and one he had hallowed by by the th Mm, I think I missed something up here. Anyway, uh, one he had hallowed uh, by the thon confessed clean Sir Palamides, and Sir Tristram and Sir Gallerson were his two godfathers. Okay. Um, <laughs> Sir Galeron is a really good sport here, I agree. Uh, <laughs> yes, and no, he's not a suffragette. <laughs> David, that's just not what that means. Okay. Sir Palamides' speech. This is Sir Palamides' finest moment, in my opinion, right? This is far, far better than his triumph, uh, his tenuous triumph, uh, his perilous triumph, morally perilous triumph, on the first day of the Tournament of Lanazep, right? Look at what he has achieved. This is Sir Palamides at peace. Sir Lamarack could not have done this better, right? Um... My offense to, is not so great to you, but that we may be friends, right? I don't want to fight you to the death, actually, right? I'm okay with not killing you and you not killing me. Let's stop fighting and be friends, right? I dare right well end it, right? And it's not just this battle that he's ending, right? It is the strife between himself and Sir Tristram. Um, he repeats his sort of the purity of his love for La Belle Isode, right? He's never offended. Um, the only offense that he's ever done is against Sir Tristram, right? I offended against you in his envy, right? In his desire to see him shamed if he could possibly do it, right? And I've paid for that, Right? You've given me many sad strokes, uh, and I've learned my lesson, right? They've, uh, uh, he has received a beating uh, m on multiple occasions. Notice, again, how important this is for Palamides. Before uh, Tristram beating the stuffing out of him, right, would make Palamides lose his mind, right? Right? to once again lose to Sir Tristram. And not only can he say, you know what, you beat the stuffing out of me again and I'm fine with it. Not only does he say he's fine with it, he says, thank you for beating the stuffing out of me, right? I deserved that. I deserve to have the stuffing beat out of me because of the offenses I have done against you, right? I take your beatings of me as like a penance for the offense that I have done towards you, right? Um... I deserved that. And it has helped, right? Penance is good for you. 
Uh, uh, penance is a super important uh, part of spiritual reconciliation. Um, to pay a price for your sins. Really important part of medieval Catholic, do Catholic doctrine. But again, notice that the very fact that his losing to Sir Tristram, the very source of his whole, all of his envy, with the whole envy problem, his whole spiritual issue, right? it's been at the heart of his whole spiritual issue. He's not only accepting that, he is embracing it as the penance for that sin, right? So it is, a, it is a really beautiful repentance on the part of uh, of Palamides here. And then again, the praise, right? Man, you are the second best knight in the world, hands down, right? Only Sir Lancelot is better than you, man, right? Like Sir Lamorak, he's able to praise the guy who beat him, right? And just appreciate how awesome Tristram is without having to gnaw his own tongue in envy uh, as, a, as a consequence. Um... So let's go to the church. I'll be baptized. He has fought his seventh battle for Jesus here. This battle has been the spiritual victory of Sir Palamides. This is Sir Palamides' repentance. He is now, his soul is now clean. He can go and be clean, confess it, right? He can go be shrived and then be baptized. He's whole now. Sir Palamides is, and Sir Tristram serves as Sir Palamides' godfather at his baptism, right? That line, and Sir Tristram and Sir Gallerson were his two godfather is, uh, kind of reminds me of, you know, and he, he himself, the Grinch, carved the roast beast, right? Uh, there's, there's, there's something similar about those two lines, I think. Um, uh, yeah, Michelle, that is how I read this as a battle for Jesus' sake, uh, because he proved through it that he'd gotten past his envy and truly repented of his sin. Yeah, it's 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 the moral battle. The outward battle is merely the the sort of manifestation of the spiritual battle, right? And also the occasion of it. It's I mean, it's all been about battles with Tristram, right? So it's not to say that it was merely symbolic. That's not what I mean. They he had to physically fight with him, right? Um, the action of um, the action of resisting the temptation to envy, like he, he he has to really overcome it, and he can't overcome it except in that moment, right? Um, you've, he's got to be actually fighting with Tristram before he can really fully overcome that envy. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, it is kind of suggestive, isn't it? Karita Karita points out that maybe each of his battles uh, were over different deadly sins, and envy was the last one. Well, yeah, if this were um, uh, if this were a more thoroughgoing moral allegory like Spencer, that's exactly how it would work, right? Um, I'm not entirely sure that's exactly how this is working there with Sir Palamides. I doubt he fought, you know, like the Knight of Gluttony or something like that earlier on, you know, and, and, and overcame, uh, you know, the Knight of Gluttony. Um, probably not exactly how it worked, but, uh, but it is interesting, though, isn't it, that you do have the seven battles, right? And this does seem to be a moral battle against envy. Uh, so that, that, that connection uh, is kind of suggestive. Anyway, um, so that's the end of the story of Tristram and Palamides, and then they go off to the great feast together, which is, of course, going to be the whole turning point of the Arthurian world. Um, it's getting late, but I started a little bit late. Let's at least begin the Lancelot stuff. Uh, I knew when I was preparing the slides for today, there was no way we were going to get through all this and that we were really, we're going to have to do an extra class here, uh, which I think we are. So next week we're going to, we're going to still be doing the Lancelot and Elaine stuff. And then we'll start the quest for the Holy Grail after that. Um, but, um, yeah, yeah. Um, Karina, I agree. The battle against sloth would be really funny. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Um, Allegorical battles are hilarious. Uh, I just love the Psychomachia. The Psychomachia is a very early medieval uh, uh, battle. It's the, 
second Makia means the you know the the battle of the soul, right? Um, uh, so it shows like the, a war between the vices and the virtues. My absolute favorite is the 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 fight between wrath and patience, right? Each uh, each uh, uh, mortal sin fights against the virtue that is its opposite, right? Uh, and patience just stands there. Wrath is like furious and upset and jumping all around, and patience just sort of sits there watching her. Right, and then like eventually, Wrath stabs herself and dies, and Patience just like brushes herself off and walks away. She never lifts a hand or does anything. So funny. Okay. Anyway, um, excellent. So I hope you guys have enjoyed the story of Palamides as much as I have. Isn't this an awesome story? I am telling you, there is no one single character whose overall character arc is more compelling, psychologically speaking, in my mind, than the story of Sir Palamides. Feature film, someday, right? Feature film. Come on, Hollywood. Feature film on Sir Palamides. Actually, it, would not, it shouldn't be a Hollywood movie. It'd be a much better indie film, right? Let's get some really cool, edgy, uh, uh, medieval, medievally inclined uh, uh, indie filmmaker to do the... Um, the Sir Palamides feature film. Okay. Let's, uh, oh yeah, I forgot. Here's the very end of this uh, as we're transitioning into the Book of the Sangreal. I love this. Here endeth the second book of Sir Tristram de Leonesse, which drawn was out of the French by Sir Thomas Mallory, knicked as Jesu be his help. Amen. I love the phrase which was drawn out of the French as if it is as if it were drawn out of the French, kind of like the Israelites were drawn out of Egypt, you know? I don't think that's exactly what Mallory means, but it kind of sounds that way. Anyway, but here is no rehearsal of the third book. Just not going to happen. But here followeth the noble tal of the Sancreal, which call it is the holy vessel and the signification the signification of blessed blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, which was brought unto this lawn by Joseph of Arimathea. Therefore, on all sinful, blessed Lord, have on thy knicked mercy. Amen. We're not going to do the third book. There will be no third book uh, of uh, Sir Tristram de Lyonesse. Uh, this is... Um, Mauer just warning us, right? You have been warned. I'm totally dropping the Tristram story now, right? So, by the way, Sir Tristram is eventually going to die, and Sir Mark is going to murder him eventually. He's going to succeed in murdering him. Uh, but whatever, that's going to happen off stage. We're not going to do. There is a third book of Sir Tristram, but we're not doing. We're going to go straight on uh, to the Holy Grail, and you can see he's already been transitioning into that, right, uh, throughout the whole Lancelot story. Uh, so the sort of uh, I apologize, except I don't apologize. We're just dropping the story of Sir Tristram from here. Um, yeah, Nancy, I agree. I, I, I too love how there's no reason, explanation, or even excuse given, right? Here is no rehearsal of the third book. Karina, exactly. It's more like he's, it's, it's more like he's managing expectations, right? If you're looking for more on the story of Sir Tristram and, and La Belle Isolde, well, tough. You're not getting it from me, right? Just... Forget about it. Go home, everybody. Party's over. It's time to go on. Um, <laughs> so, there, so, so there it is. Thanks for explaining that. Okay. One last point before we start the story with uh, 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 with Elaine. Lancelot. Remember I talked about the dividing of the court into factions, and we, we could see very clearly we've got the Orcish knights, right, at the tournament, the Knights of Orkney. We have Lancelot's kin, and of course we had that quartet of the Green Knights uh, who began the tournament at Lanazep together, Tristram and Palamides and Dinadin and Sir Gareth. Um, we can see these different factions forming. Sir Tristram has a kind of faction with Sir Dinadin and now Sir Gareth as well. Sir Lancelot, of course. There's all those French knights, his kinsmen, uh, and then there's uh, and then there's of course Arthur's people, who are kind of Gawain's people, which is not a good look. Um, but um, anyhow, so um, remember that Sir Lancelot goes around with a posse most of the time, right? He 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 he's got uh, he's got a he's got a squad with him of his own kin. Because there are rumors that Sir Gawain 
is envious of him too and is going to try to get him on his own and kill him like they did Lamarack, right? And so his kin are not going to have that. Um, but this is the interesting point. When Sir Tristram's reputation is growing and growing and everybody's starting to talk about Sir Tristram and what an awesome knight he is and he's like practically the best knight in the world, right? We get this really interesting little turn. But thus as Sir Tristram sought and inquired after Sir Palamides, Sir Tristram enchieved many great battles, where through all the noise and brute, which means noise, fell to Sir Tristram, and the nam ceased of Sir Launcelot. And therefore Sir Launcelot, his brethren, and his kinsmen, would have slain Sir Tristram because of his fam. But when Sir Launcelot wist how his kinsmen were set, he said to them openly, Wit thou well that and any of you be so hardy to wait my lord Sir Tristram with any hurt, sham, or villainy, as I am true kneeked, I shall slay the best of you all I slay the best of you all mine own hondes. Alas fie for sham should ye for his noble deed is a white to slay him. Jesu defend, said Sir Launcelot, that ever any noble kneeked as is Sir Tristram is, should be destroyed with treason. So of this noise and fam sprang into Cornwall and unto them of Lyonnes, whereof they were passing glad and mad great joy. And thon they of Lyonnes sent letters unto Sir Tristram of recommendation, and many great giftes to maintain Sir Tristram's estate, and ever between Sir Tristram resorted unto joyous guard, whereas La Belle Isode was that loved him ever. So he's living on, still living in Lancelot's little, uh, little, uh, you know, love nest with La Belle Isode, and now he's getting, he's getting uh, 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 an allowance sent him by the other uh, people of Cornwall who are faithful to him and not to King Mark. Um, Yes, Gerald, I was thinking exactly the same thing. Lancelot does hear exactly what Arthur should have done. Sir Lamorak had not died, had Arthur died. Arthur should have gone to Gawain and Agravain and Mordred long since and said, any of you ambushes one of, you know, my other good knights out of envy and murders him, I will kill them with my own hands. Right. I am not having any. I will not stand for any of that nonsense for one second. Arthur has not done that. Lancelot does it. Right. Lancelot keeps his kin in line. He is there is no question with Lancelot what is right and what is wrong. And yeah, I agree, uh, Carita. You've got to love how specific he is. Right. Um, you are not to hurt him. You're not to bring him shame or villainy, right? I'm, I'm going to, no loopholes in this, right? Anybody does anything against Sir Tristram and I am going to take it to you, right? Um, we see the tensions, right? I've talked before about the tensions, about the, 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 the cracks that we're kind of seeing in the Arthurian world. I think that we see them uh, showing up pretty strongly here. All right, well, let's just, we'll end with the teaser here. As the, as the book of French maketh mention, afore the time that Sir Galahad was begotten or born, there come in an ermit unto King Arthur, upon Whitsunday, as the Kniecht is sate at the round table. And when the ermit saw the siege perilous, he asked the king and all the Kniechtes why that siege was void. Fan King Arthur, for all the Kniechtes, answered and sighed, There shall never none sit in that siege but on. But if he be destroyed, Than said the Eremit, Sir, wot ye what he is? Nay, said King Arthur and all the Kniechtes, we know not who he is that shall sit here, that shall sit there. Then wot I, said the Eremit, for he that shall sit there is yet unborn and unbegotten, and this psalm year he shall be begotten, that shall sit in that siege perilous, and he shall win the Sancreal. When this Eremite had mad this mention, he departed from the court of King Arthur. It's been a while since we've had somebody utter prophecies like this, right? You, uh, um, you, uh, um, gotta miss Merlin, right? Um, 
Yeah, Gerald, exactly. They have at least a portion of the site of Merlin, these random hermits, right? But uh, in the absence of Merlin, somebody's got to step into the breach, and it's the Hermits' Union of Logris, which is gonna, which is gonna, in fact, step into that niche, right? Uh, somebody has to fill that role, and uh, yeah, the Hermits' Guild—they're gonna take care of it. This same year, shall the knight who shall sit in the siege perilous be begotten, and he shall win the Sancreal. Um. Once again, we lead with spoilers, right? Um, everybody's going to know exactly what's going to happen before it happens, right? And one thing that I would want to point out about that in advance, think how appropriate that is when envy is the predominant sin of the Arthurian court, right? Um, but anyway, we'll, we'll come back to that as we see it come through. All right, I'm not going to keep you up all night. There's no way we're going to get a significant way through, so we might as well stop. Uh, we will begin with the story. Um, uh, uh, we will have the rather interesting meeting uh, between Lancelot and Elaine, who is rarely overdressed um, uh, and, uh, and, and we'll see their adventures. And of course we'll get to meet the Holy Grail for the first time. So thanks everybody. Uh, I, I appreciate your indulgence as I take my time over the story of Sir Palamides. Uh, now it's time for the serious business of the Holy Grail. Uh, and of course the relationship drama between Lancelot and Guinevere. Thanks everybody. See you guys next week. Bye now. The Mythgard Academy has been offering in-depth discussions of awesome books and films since 2013, completely free to attend and free to download. If you've enjoyed our discussions and would like to help them continue, please consider donating at signumuniversity.org fund.